Gracious God, we thank you for uh, this, uh, this day, for, for health, and uh, uh, that we have this opportunity to uh, come together in fellowship and uh, to study your word. Uh, send down your Holy Spirit upon our reading and our discussion uh, that we may uh, find new truths that you have to reveal to us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, from now through the Easter season, which is until Pentecost, we don't have Old Testament readings. We read from Acts. And uh, that's the way it is you know, every year. Um, and we don't read it straight through. Uh, we go bounce around. Um, and... Uh, uh, Interesting, you know, because in the Christian calendar, Pentecost, the actual date of Pentecost comes not for several weeks. Um, you know, the, the main event we don't actually hear about. We, it's, it's referred to and alluded to, um, but, you know, we all know that it has come, uh, it has happened there. And uh, so today we're into the, to the fourth chapter. Um, <clears throat> And this is uh, the uh, the the reading that you know. I guess some people uh, sarcastically call the communist reading. Uh, everybody put their put all their possessions together, uh, and uh, you know. So, uh, but um, essentially. Um, the entire book of Acts, which of course was written by Luke, the, the person that wrote the Gospel of Luke. So this is a continuation, just as he was trying to write, you know, um, a an account of Jesus' life. Uh, if you remember how Luke starts, to he wanted to write a, an orderly account, you know, of Jesus Christ. Well, now he's doing the same uh, for period of time after uh, the resurrection. Um, and so, you know, he chronicles uh, the uh, rise of the early church. And I guess, um, you know, theologically, how we look at how what we're doing in this season of Easter with Acts is that, you know, Acts is addressing the question of what now, you know, after what does the resurrection of Jesus make possible in the world? Um, so um, at, in Acts, you, you're going to have, you're going to be reading sermons, you know, particularly uh, from Peter. Um, and um, you know, there, there are going to be some, you know, unexpected confrontations, uh, some uh, seemingly miraculous conversions or unexpected conversions uh, to uh, what they call during at this point uh, the way. Actually, uh, it's not called Christianity until sometime later, and it was actually given that term um, in a rather derogatory manner by non Christians. It came to be what you know, the name eventually came to be the new the name of the new faith. Um, earlier in, the, in uh, this chapter, chapter four, uh, Peter and John had been arrested, and they appeared before uh, the Jewish rulers. Uh, 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 the that would have been the Sanhedrin, um, the one who settled disputes. You know, sort of the the, the body of judges. Uh, um, they were they were arrested because uh, for the crime of having spoken to the people about Jesus and his resurrection. And they've wondered if they're being questioned because they helped a sick man um, uh, who was actually or now became one of the followers. Um, but um, it, it appears that the court uh, really didn't have the power to sentence him. Uh, uh, so they chose to, to free them. 
uh, with the warning that they're not to speak or teach in public uh, in the name of Jesus. Uh, this is a way of maintaining uh, the existing leadership uh, system uh, in, in the Jewish faith. Um, It also, it gives us a picture of what these early followers, what their community looked like, and that um, the, the unity of purpose that they, they felt and their commitment to the well-being of all of their uh, members, um, especially the most vulnerable members. Um, and uh, so, you know, when this sort of bears uh, witness to the new life that is possible in Christ. Um, this is the, the second of two descriptions of uh, this harmonious communal life uh, among the believers in Jerusalem. Uh, at this point, they're just talking about Jerusalem. Uh, the previous one is found in Acts 2, uh, which is comes at the end of the Pentecost story. Um, and the, the way it's arranged in Acts 2 indicates that you know, the Holy Spirit uh, is about more than providing you know, uh, the ability for people of all languages you know, to hear one another. Um, but it also uh, gives... I guess, um, the, the courage or the incentive for public speaking uh, about Christ. Um, and that, you know, it's underlying this because it's already, Pentecost has already happened, is that the Holy Spirit pulls people together. Um, and uh, so um, that they are able to, you know, to worship, to live, you know, in, uh, in community. Um, so in a way, this is, you could also say this is a story of uh, salvation that's beginning to happen. Um, we get some other information from this passage about the, uh, the believers in Jerusalem. Uh, the, the text says that they share a single heart and soul. Um, this indicates uh, an intensity of devotion to one another and a, a, a shared uh, way of being that was part of the, um, the ancient Greek philosophical discourse about the virtues of friendship. Uh, you hear similar ideas that are of the ones expressed here in Plato's Republic. Um, which, you know, which he envisioned a, a thriving society in which people um, you know, were not possessive of things. You know, they, they spoke instead of like, what's mine and not mine, uh, but, uh, or you know, what is alien and friendly. Uh, they, the, you know, Plato envisioned you know, that we speak of in terms of our, you know, and, and, and think always in terms of community. Um, so like with uh, Plato, the, the vision of this kind of perfect society was one that, um, that was uh, just, you know, economically uh, just uh, as well as politically. Um, you know, this were the idea of, of uh, people that were, uh, could, would sell their land. Uh, and, you know, if you had any extra land, you know, that your house wasn't sitting on or wasn't, you know, being used, uh, you know, uh, for, for farming and your, you know, subsistence, um, that meant you had more than you needed. So, uh, the idea was that they sell the land and then distribute it to the people that had nothing. Another bit of information that we get about 
this uh, population um, was that they, that the idea that, uh, well, going along with that, that what happened when people gave to the vulnerable, the ones that didn't have enough, is that they allowed them literally to live. Um, later on, you know, just after this, you know, we learned that some of the more prosperous members of the church, um, you know, sell things to, in order to provide for other Christ followers. Um, and they uh, sort of put it into the communal, to the kitty. You know, they give it to the apostles to manage. Um, so, you know, this was more than just redistributing wealth. Um, they were willing to hand over control, you know, th their status and their privilege and their security um, to someone else to benefit others. And, you know, essentially, you know, we're talking about uh, this, is, this is how our taxes work. You know, that um, we, yes, we benefit, you know, we, from the things that the government uh, does for us, uh, but it also uh, benefits society as a whole. You know, for example, you know, public education, not everybody has children in school, but, you know, it's, we have this, most people have the understanding that it benefits all of society you know, in order to, to have public schools and that it's, uh, everyone benefits from it. Um, I always uh, like that saying that, uh, that uh, uh, we should always be sure to uh, support education because these are the people who will be taking care of us in our old age, you know. <laughs> you don't want people who can't read and write, you know, managing your medications. <laughs> <laughs> various things so but unfortunately you know there are a lot of people that just can't think that way they can't think beyond their own immediate needs and so there's always this conflict um of over over taxes um And then, um, you know, we have to also consider what the biblical view of wealth was, that not that they're not that wealth was bad, but that uh, people prioritizing wealth, uh, you know, we call it, you know, worshiping wealth rather than God, what it what it ended up doing was dividing people um, and putting up boundaries from one you know, one group of people to another. Uh, we see, you know, in the world, uh, the damage that disparity of wealth does uh, to the whole. Um, I read this one quote, um, it says, money here will be used to destroy what money is usually used to create, which is distance and boundaries between people. Um, so you know, this, is a, this is a whole new ideology that's the, totally the opposite from the empire at the time. Um, the question is, you know, we ask, well, it, did they really live like this, you know, or is this just an ideal? Uh, we do know that from writing such as I've mentioned before, Josephus, who was a, a Jewish historian, um, that the early Christians were known for uh, taking care of the vulnerable, you know, not just in their own communities, but, you know, they, they made a very um, strong witness for taking care of, you know, all the people that, you know, from the Old Testament, you know, the widows and the orphans and the, and the aliens and the sick and so forth. Um, and that this was something that other people outside the church noticed. And we get uh, 
from later in, in Acts, and of course in Paul's epistles, that no, it was not always the case, you know, human nature being what it is. I mean, shortly after we have this, after this, we have this uh, man Barnabas who sells his, uh, his properties and, and gives to the, the apostles uh, to take care of the needy. But then we also have the story of um, Ananias and Sephora who, uh, you know, did not, you know, who hoarded their, their wealth. And this is one of the stories I've never liked. You know, they ended up being God smiting them. Uh, <laughs> I don't like stories like that. Years ago, uh, I was uh, teaching uh, vacation Bible school and I had just, it was a summer after I graduated from college and um, it was uh, inner city children. It was a program um, uh, that the church did for inner city children. And one of the first lessons I was given to do was the story of Ananias and Sephora. And man, you know, I called my, you know, res resident uh, pastor, uh, religion professor <laughs> about that. like, how do you do this story <laughs> with, with second graders, you know? <laughs> Uh, not easy, particularly when, you know, they take everything at that age, everything is pretty much literal. Uh, yes. so, uh, but what it, the story does do is, is give two uh, models, you know, one of what uh, the kind of generosity uh, that Jesus uh, taught uh, with Barnabas as opposed to, you know, Ananias and Sephora. And, you know, in the Bible, frequently there's a setup like this with the match showing you, you know, like th think about uh, the rich man and Lazarus, you know, um, you know, Luke has a lot of them, you know, in the, in the parables, you know, showing you uh, the extremes, I guess. Um, <laughs> and what I've also had I've read is that it was only in Jerusalem that we you know we have written data to support that this practice was actually done. Um, you mean the practice of communal? Yes, sharing of, of property and, and so forth. Um, and certainly, you, you know, from Paul's epistles that <clears throat> that became a problem in his new church starts, you know, everything from people hoarding the communion bread and wine uh, <laughs> to uh, <clears throat> remember one letter <clears throat> in which he uh, praised the Macedonians because it was one of the poorest uh, churches, you know, in the empire. And yet, you know, they sent money to uh, other poor churches, whereas, you know, and then he was chastising, um, you know, the, in the letter to the congregation, he sent the letter to, he said, look at what the Macedonians are doing, you know, as, you know, aren't you ashamed of yourself <laughs> for being so stingy? Um, And then certainly, um, you know, th this idea is, is not something new to Jesus. This comes out of uh, the idea in the Old Testament of the Jubilee, you know, when um, everything, you know, anything that had been taken from families after 50 years, you know, the land was returned to them so that there wouldn't be a cycle of poverty. You know, we don't know if that actually was done. You know, it was just that that was what was, uh, you know, from God, <laughs> that that's what should be done. And it was, a, it was, it was social justice, you know, so that you wouldn't have people just, you know, in this cycle of poverty that just spiraled, kept spiraling downward you know, until they couldn't, you know, couldn't exist. Um,
Um, it's kind of, you know, it's hard to imagine in our society today because it's so, uh, it's so consumer oriented. You know, the the marketplace is, you know, is is king, um, and it. Uh, It's one that uh, many Christians uh, just say, oh, this is pie in the sky, you know, because it, because it can't be done like this, that we can't eliminate, you know, poverty uh, or is that, you know, we don't even need to try, you know, because it, well, um, but actually that isn't true. One, we can eliminate poverty. Um, uh, but um, with any ideal, you know, if, if because it's difficult, we stop trying, you know, that's exactly what, you know, Jesus was preaching against, you know, that th you know, there, we always have this responsibility uh, to uh, make uh, the earth more like the kingdom of God. And Jesus preached that whenever this is done, no matter how, uh, on what small a scale it is, that this is the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. And it happens in the present. Um, so, um, <clears throat> I was reading in an article in, in preparation for this, and it was, came from, uh, it was about uh, the UK. And of course, we know that in Europe, there are greater taxes, but you know there are also greater services. There's more uh, net, uh, safety nets because, particularly because of uh, nationalized healthcare, which is the number one cause of bankruptcy in this country is, is becoming ill. Um, and they said before, you know, the big global crash that happened in around 2007, you know, that went into, you know, 2008, where the whole global economy, uh, because we are, inter we are interdependent economically, <clears throat> that um, they said that food pantries were almost non-existent in the UK. But after that time, they started cropping up. Uh, more and more. Um, <coughs> this which goes to, you know, one way of, of tending to, you know, the most vulnerable society is through charity, which is what food banks are. But actually, you know, what the Bible uh, tells us is that um, although charity is good, justice is better, you know, giving people the opportunity to rise above poverty. Um, and that, that goes, you know, throughout the Bible. We have the same issue, of course, now in terms of the common good with uh, the vaccination. You know, this isn't wealth, although, you know, economics does enter into it just like it does every other issue in society. But, you know, we're, we're dealing now with um, the, the consequences or, or the issue of um, how to treat people who uh, refuse to be vaccinated, you know, whether or not uh, people should prove that they are vaccinated. Um, and uh, it, it always amuses me how uh, you know people will will liken having proof of vaccination, uh, you know, being like uh, oh, you know, tattooing you know the Jews during uh, during World War II when we have always had means of identification that have been required. Uh, you know, if you get caught. Uh, not driving without your license on you, you know, that's against the law, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so, uh, you know, it's 
the the uh, the, uh, the arguments just don't hold up. You know that our civil even, rights are being you know violated. Even your dog and cat, how you have to have proof that you vaccinated them. If they catch them running loose and they don't have tags, you get a fine. Yeah, I'm not saying we should be fined if we don't have our vaccination tags, but I'm just saying. <laughs> and you have to pay you have to pay thirty five dollars for those tags. Yeah, or at least I did for a dog for each yeah. dog. Yeah, but so and that you know part of that is uh, what if your dog bites somebody? You know, right? It's for the general welfare. When I was signed up, to know if they had had their shots. (laughs) When I signed up at ICC for medical lab technology after I retired from my real job and started a second career, I had to have all these vaccinations because I was going into hospitals and. Mm-hmm. places where people are sick and I had to be able to prove I'd been vaccinated mm-hmm. to ICC and mm-hmm. everybody just kind of did did that mm-hmm. feel violated by it so yeah, everybody school, good it was, for the good the in, it was good yeah. for the people in the hospital mm-hmm. and the people mm-hmm. we were coming in contact with I remember you know when I first started working for the public schools I had to have proof that I had a tb shot mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know I had to get, have that to go to work for the state. They made me get a TB shot. Mm-hmm. Teaching, teaching, you have to go through that too. Yeah, and that's have, yeah. You know, TB definitely. So um, anyway, um, the Psalm one thirty three. Uh, even though it's not a response to an Old Testament reading, like, you know, originally, it really does make uh, a a night, uh, is a great segue from uh, the Acts, there's uh, a short, short verse, Um, we, um, we often hear it um, in, in services, uh, you know, where churches are, are merging, um, you know, our um, ecumenical events, you know, when people from different denominations or even different faiths, you know, come together, uh, this is a very um, common uh, verse that's used. Um, Psalm 133 is part of what's called the Song of Ascents. Uh, ascent meaning, you know, going up to a high place. Um, for the Jewish people uh, in ancient times, um, you know, Jerusalem was built on a hill. So you had to, you know, go up to get Jerusalem. And then the temple was built on the highest point um, on that hill. So, um, you know, the song of ascent wa- would be something that pilgrims would sing you know, when they came to Jerusalem, uh, you know, for, you know, feast days, uh, like Passover. Yeah. Um, the Psalms 120 through 1, 134 are all what is known as song of, songs of ascent. And of course, uh, you know, what they're talking about is coming together for worship at the temple. And, uh, you know, biblically, that is where God promised to meet them. It gives this particular psalm, it it gives a blessing, um, you know, promising life to God's people and uh, proclaims uh, a oneness of faith um, that the two Themes here are, of course, abundance and unity. They say that, you know, it's a, the psalmist says that right, right up front. Um, another thing um, it, it's good to know, or interesting to know, maybe, that um, at this time, you know, in ancient times when the psalm was written, um, when a father died, his sons remained on the land, and they, you know, they shared the responsibility 
of taking care uh, of the land, of uh, the property. Um, and this was not easy, as you can imagine. Uh, you know, think about what happens when, uh, uh, you know, parents die, you know, and the will, what happens after the will is read, you know, you can imagine, you know, and we know that the eldest son got the bigger portion by far. Uh, so, you know, unity was not easy <laughs> in, in these circumstances. Um, so something that they, they understood very well of, of, of how easy it is to have disunity in a family, in a, a nuclear family, as well as in a, a, a faith family. The verses um, about you know the precious oil, the, the metaphor there, precious oil running, uh, or I guess it's no simile. I guess is what I should say about the precious oil running upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron. If you remember, Aaron um, uh, was the, the father of the priestly caste, uh, uh, the tribe. Um, and so, you know, on the beard of Aaron, uh, when priests were uh, sort of commissioned or whatever, they were anointed with oil. So, but here we have it, you know, overflowing you know, running down, not just anointing the head, but, you know, running down the beard and forth. And so on. Um, and can you think of another Psalm where you hear uh, the, the phrase anointing with oil. Psalm 23. Yeah, <laughs> that's the one we think about, you know, uh, he anoint us by head with oil. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, here it's not just the head, it's, you know, running down his beard, down his robes, you know, his feet. Um, think about it you know, what can flow? When you think about what matter, the only thing that can flow is a liquid. So here he's using two uh, liquids, oil and then water, the dew. Uh, yeah. um, so of course the, the oil was used to consecrate, that's the word I was looking for, consecrate a priest. Um, then the mention of uh, Mount Hermon, it is like the dew of Hermon. Uh, Mount Hermon is to the north of Israel. And so it is, um, it's colder. Um, there are, there's snow on the tops of, you know, the high ground for a good part of the year. Um, so, you know, it's up above the Jordan Valley. So you know, when it got warmer, the melting snow and in this case, it's referred to as dew, you know, flow down into the valley. And of course, they were dependent on that in the valley, you know, for it to, in order for it to be fertile, you had to have that water flowing down from Mount Hermon. Um, and of course, you know, obviously it was precious because, you know, this is desert land, you know, any water was absolutely critical. Um, now, the word kindred, which is used here, and uh, how very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. Uh, kindred can also be translated as brothers or brothers and sisters. <laughs> um, it doesn't mean blood relatives. Uh, Mostly, you know, the, the inference here is that it's people joined together by God's grace, you know, rather than particular bloodlines. Um, 
And it, and like the, the Acts uh, passage, we would call it uh, ambitious or maybe uh, speaking about an ideal because it's calling for all people to worship God. Well, of course, the people that worshiped God at the time the psalmists were writing was a very small minority. Uh, now, um, to going back to, you know, the priest anointing, uh, priests weren't the only ones that that used oil. It was actually uh, a, um, uh, a ritual of hospitality. When people came to someone's house, uh, a host would, uh, or at least a generous good host uh, would provide oil uh, to a guest uh, for anointing before the meal. So um, it not only was uh, like a, uh, consecration, you know, a, a religious thing. It was also um, a symbol of hospitality, you know, of accepting people, inviting them in to eat, which of course is, you know, the the greatest form, you know, the Bible. Uh, you only eat with uh, people you love, you know, or people you have esteem for, uh, you know, which you know is why uh, Jesus was so scandalous because he didn't follow the, the, the rules of bound, boundaries, societal boundaries, and ate with, uh, had this same feeling of welcome uh, and uh, modeled that kind of welcome for everyone. For us as Christians, um, you know, we don't have you know, a temple, a high point, but suffice it to say that I think East, we would call Easter being our high point. You know, it's not a place, but it is an event that is our high point in our faith. Um, and we remember that, you know, uh, there was a woman that anointed Jesus, uh, his feet uh, before the crucifixion. Um, and the, the women came to anoint his body, you know, for burial. Um, so, and then, of course, you know, when, with the empty tomb, that kind of turned everything out uh, around that, um, unlike oil, life was no longer scarce, but abundant. Um, and uh, we might say that, you know, grace was like an overflowing fountain for us. Um, it um, and also with Christians, it uh, oil signifies uh, worship. Um, um, and unity, you know, death separates people, but resurrection um, promises that we will uh, dwell with Christ and one another forever. Um, so. Um, and we do, I mean, it isn't just, uh, it used to be that uh, anointing uh, with oil was something that, you know, Catholics and Episcopalians uh, did. I'm not sure about Lutherans. Uh, but with the liturgical renewal movement of the 70s and gradually, you know, becoming the sacraments, becoming more important um, in, the, in the Protestant faith. Um, you know, anointing is, is done uh, pretty regularly, at least in the mainline churches. You know, we anoint, besides putting water you know, on the head, uh, we anoint with a, with a cross uh, on someone who's newly baptized, you know, an infant or whatever. Uh, at death, you know, I, I did a, I, I was telling somebody this morning about uh, my last visit with Bill Olson, which was, it was a uh, uh, Sunday afternoon and he died that night uh, or, you know, one o'clock Monday morning. And uh, there is a service in the Presbyterian Book of Worship, which I did with him. Um, and, it, you know, calls for uh, anointing 
you know, the head, you know, putting a cross of, of oil on the forehead. Um, it's just, uh, as, as we say about a sacrament, it's a, it's a, sacraments are a sign and a seal. And um, even though um, unlike, uh, death is not considered a sacrament in the uh, a time of, of sacrament at the, the end of life, uh, it has come uh, to be uh, the sacredness of one's passing has become much more um, we become much more aware of it and understanding of it in in the mainline churches and everybody that I've ever talked to after they became a pastor um, talked about their understanding of the holiness of death <coughs> And I think that's important because we are we are of a society that that denies death. You know, the, the whole idea of uh, you know uh, putting people in a hospital as soon as they become you know uh, seriously ill, you know, at the end of life, uh, so that you know it used to be people died at home, and mostly now they die in hospitals, and uh, you know we've had generations of, of kids now don't really understand death because they've never seen it, you know. Um, so, you know, we, we are a, a society that very much uh, uh, honors youth and good health. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, it's, it's considered like, you know, that's a failure. <laughs> It's a failure to get sick. It's a failure to die. You know, it's something that. Uh, um, um, I'll go on now to uh, First John. Um, <clears throat> now, we are starting. We're going to read from First John throughout the Easter uh, season this year. Um, first John is, uh, doesn't start and end like second John and third John. And so that's raised questions about whether it's more of a, a short address rather than an actual letter. Um, and, or it could be that second John and third John were just some brief notes that were tacked on and sent along with first John, um, sure uh, it was it would not have been written by the same author of the gospel of John but most likely uh, they were both part of maybe at different times uh, what is known as the Johannine community uh, a faith community that uh, the, the person who wrote the gospel of John uh, was a leader <coughs> even though it's called the, the, the first epistle of John, it's never mentioned that the author's name is John. So um, it's also not written in the, the standard form of a letter in, you know, in the Greco-Roman uh, tradition. <clears throat> it's sort of, it's sort of like, you know, an, an essay, maybe a homily, or uh, sort of uh, what sometimes we call meditations that are, are are put together because they have a common theme. But you know, we know we do believe that they both came out of the Johannine community because um, the writings, um, what the themes are similar. They were at this time, uh, of course, no, you know that John was the latest gospel written. By this time, unity was a big problem. You know, they were actually dealing with schisms <laughs> in, in the churches. Um, so the author is writing uh, 
to kind of to prevent that from happening, uh, to, from joining a rival group. You know, um, today, like I see this, you know, in the presbytery, you know, where you know a new pastor will come in and um, will uh, lead. Uh, will create a division in the church and then uh, proceed to leave and start another church taking, you know, the members, you know, that, that they've cultivated uh, to this new church. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's what the writer was trying to prevent. <coughs> One of the, uh, just like with Paul's letters, we don't know exactly uh, the issue because we don't, we're not told what the problem was. What we're told is the writer's response to what the problem was. So going backwards in that way, it, it uh, and from what we gather from other, you know, biblical sources, New Testament sources, um, it seems that, uh, at least one of the major controversies of the Johannine community um, had to do with the, the nature of Christ. Um, there was a group that denied that um, that Jesus was human. Um, this eventually became known as docetism, um, coming from the Greek word uh, dokin which means to seem that Jesus only seemed like he was human, but he really wasn't. Um, and, you know, this was the big issue that was settled at uh, uh, the, uh, the Nicene Council. And why we have, you know, the earliest creed was the Nicene Creed. And it says, fully human, fully God. Uh, they got to write the creed because they won. Uh, <laughs> And docetism is kind of, um, is also related to uh, Gnosticism, which arose in, in, in the second century, um, which the idea of Gnosticism was also that Jesus only seemed to be human was not. And then that human flesh is inherently evil. You know? uh, again, that was something that didn't win out in the <laughs> when they were hashing out Christian doctrine early on. <clears throat> so you know the Gnostics said that you know their argument was that Jesus, there's no way Jesus could have been human because that would have meant he was flesh and flesh is inherently evil, so that uh, it was not possible. Which also meant that Christ didn't physically die, um, and which meant that the resurrection didn't really happen. It was just an illusion. Wow. So, uh, that's why you know, the, the early Christian communities and, and like the author of First John, you know, of course this uh, was at the heart, the foundation of their, their beliefs. So you know, they were very much uh, invested in dispelling these ideas in their congregations. Um, the beginning of, uh, of First John, uh, it, uh, I have it here, but it, it's very much like uh, the beginning of the Gospel of John, which is another reason we know that it was somebody in that community, someone who, uh, for whom the author John, you know, was a mentor. So in this, in, in our passage, uh, the author there is insisting that, that true fellowship with God uh, is possible only through the Son, uh, Jesus Christ, um, and that um, his you know, human earthly life and his ministry revealed the way of eternal life 
And here again is that understanding that eternal life is not something that just happens in the future. Living an eternal life starts in the present. We, what we also know from these letters that, that another um, argument that was going on that was creating dissension uh, was that there were some that uh, thought that they had already uh, arrived, so to speak, spiritually. You know, kind of like the idea of I've been saved, so you know, there's nothing more I need to do. Um, that was an idea that you know that some people in the in these con in the early congregations uh, believed, which of course you can imagine what that did to the unity of the congregation. You know, I'm, you know, I got up all, all the answers, you know, I'm saying you're not, you know, <laughs> doesn't fly well. Uh, you know, it was almost, you know, as if saying like that, you know, we have no sin, you know, which is also pretty uh, uh, blasphemous <laughs> to, uh, you know, what Jesus was saying. Um, that uh, they were all sinners. Uh, and uh, in this passage here, the, the author is, is making it clear that anyone who claims this, you know, is, self, is deluded, you know. Uh, <laughs> um, but, it says, but if we confess our sins, so here he's saying there's an alternative to this, you know, self-deception. Um, when we confess, then we allow the healing to come in to our lives. Um, so, uh, as far as confessing our sins and then receiving God's forgiveness. And that, you know, we are assured of forgiveness because Jesus is our judge. Here, the word is, is paraclete. Uh, uh, we, um, we, know, we know that that forgiveness is assured because Jesus will always advocate for us. Also, I would say that um, the idea of Jesus being uh, being human and the the suffering and the dying for us shows that that uh, that God is not distant or detached from our everyday existence, uh, but God enters fully into our human lives. So, so for the writer of this uh, first John. Um, you know, the resurrection really matters because otherwise, you know, God is not with us. Um, I think um, one of the things that we can glean from this is that, um, you know, and, and this is a problem that many uh, churches have, is that fellowship is not just this um, cozy gathering of people that think alike. You know, there's more work involved <laughs> than that. You know, uh, that's part of our pledge as, as membership. Um, that like our family, that you know we mostly <laughs> stick together even when we disagree on things you know and where it, it takes a lot for families to to break apart um and in the same way you know the author is saying this is this is the way it is with being a member of the christian faith you know is that you have uh a responsibility, I guess, if you are going to follow Christ, then you need to live like Christ. And that means, you know, fellowship 
with everyone. Uh, Did you notice that the in here one of the major uh, uses of imagery that the Gospel of John has is uh, light and dark. I mean, it's just throughout the Gospel of John. Here, this author also uses uh, light and dark. Um, you know, the God, the God being light. Uh, Any other thoughts here before I go on to the gospel? Oh, shoot, it's two o'clock. <laughs> okay, well, I'll go on to the gospel. We always have this story the, the Sunday after Easter. You know, poor old doubting Thomas. Uh, I think one of the reasons that we have uh, John after Easter, and particularly the you know the the first week after Easter, is that John is the only gospel writer that talks about the week after Easter. In the other three gospels, everything happens you know on the day, you know Jesus appears, you know on on uh, what we you know now we call Sunday morning. And um, everything happens that day. But in John, um, we have a whole uh, group of appearances throughout the whole first week of Easter. So we know at this time, you know, that Jesus' death was, was super traumatic, you know, for his followers and particularly the disciples. Um, and uh, in, in John's gospel, you know, the, uh, the women do proclaim, you know, do speak up, you know, in, in Mark, they just run away here. You know, we actually have that Mary Magdalene announces to Peter and another disciple, you know, that he is risen, uh, that she's seen him. But um, we know that not all of the disciples were, were convinced um, um, you know, the, the empty tomb was not enough for them because there could be other explanations for that. You know, remember, you know, first Mary Magdalene thought somebody had stolen the body, you know, which is, you know, the first thing, the logic, first logical thought, you know, one would have. Um, so they're still frightened, you know, frightened of the Romans, they're frightened of the, the Jewish uh, hierarchy leaders, so they're cowering in fear, you know, in the, in the locked room. Um, we know this, you know, the feeling of lockdown. <laughs> We've had it ourselves. <laughs> Extended. Um, um, then on the evening of Easter Sunday, Jesus appears. And um, to the to some of the disciples, not Thomas, of course, and says, "Peace be with you." And he shows them the marks of the nails in his hands and the, the hole in his side. Um, but um, but as I said, um, Thomas wasn't there. Um, and then, so Jesus appears again in this locked room, and um, Thomas is there, and comes in and uh, says the same thing. And he says it three times, four to threes, uh, peace I leave with you. Um, One thing uh, that I think is interesting to note is that uh, Thomas never says he doesn't believe in the resurrection. He doesn't believe 
in the other disciples uh, telling him, you know, that Jesus is resurrected. And it's kind of makes you think of like a court case, you know, that about hearsay evidence, you know, it's, you know, hearsay is not admissible, you know, it, there's, it's not proof. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> Thomas is just being a good lawyer here. <laughs> if, if you don't consider that an oxymoron. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, but I think one of the things here uh, is that Jesus' presence with them was part of a relationship. And Thomas is feeling left out of the relationship, you know, that the other disciples had, uh, had been in the presence of the risen Christ and he hadn't. Um, but, uh, you know, if you look at it this way, you know, Thomas, I always, you know, think Thomas got a bad rap because there were in John's gospel, there were disciples that saw uh, the risen Christ on you know the day of resurrection, but they were still in the locked room, you know, a week later. So you know, who's really the doubter here? <laughs> and of course, the other you know important thing to note is that you know Jesus offers to show him you know his hands and his side, just like he did the other disciples. And Thomas never takes him up on it. You know, Thomas just says, you know, my Lord and my God. So, uh, it actually uh, took less convincing of Thomas than the others. Um, Okay, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to go on. I will also add, just in the story of Thomas, that this is the, se this is the second time Thomas um, appears in John's gospel, and the second time, you know, that he speaks. Um, and it, the first time is back in the 14th chapter of John, it says, and you know the way to the place where I'm going. Jesus speaking. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. If you know me, you will know my father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So Thomas is a pretty important figure in, in uh, John's gospel. And uh, so it's it sort of, uh, concludes that whole conversation because the questions that Thomas asked back in chapter 14, you know, how we know the way, when he makes that confession, you know, my Lord and my God, you know, Thomas gets it. You know, that's his aha moment. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to stop here and uh, let you talk uh, and tell me if there's anything you know you want to uh, that has stuck out for you uh, in terms of the relevance of these scriptures about you know how they fit together. Um, anything new that you're seeing you know as you were reading it you know prior to our getting together. You noticed. I have a question. Uh, sure. is it Thomas, who was called the twin. Yes. Why? Why was he called the twin? I mean, did he have a twin? I mean, evidently, <laughs> but we don't know him. Okay. All right. I'm just wondering about that. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, the Bible is really short on details. <laughs> And it's most, fru most frustrating for us is the Gospels. You know, we want to know so much more. Uh, and uh, I mean, just look, there's not a single physical description of Jesus in all four Gospels. Yeah. 
and that's kind of maddening for us, you know, because we're all we're we're all into appearances, you know. We want to know what he looked like, <laughs> which means that any artistic uh, uh, portrayal of him uh, is valid, because we really don't know. We we can make assumptions, you know. We can make assumptions about his skin and hair and eye color because of where he lived. And that's all. Yeah. You mentioned that John is the only one that talks about what happened after Easter to any extent. Mm, right. Is it true that there is um, like 40 days there where Jesus mm -hmm. walked around and people saw yeah. him? And, mm -hmm. and then he ascended into heaven. And that's the yes. part that I'm struggling with, that he just went up. Yeah. Uh, should we take that literally? Or what, well, what should the hell you know, look like, like the rapture people, you know, the, like, like they, looking at Jesus and all of a sudden, shoom, he goes up yep. into the sky. Well, look, look about, uh, look at the psalm and what the word ascend meant to them. Uh, to the Jews of the time, um, you ascended to Jerusalem, then you ascended to the temple. And at the temple was where you met God. That's where God dwelled. So Jesus' ascension uh, is not um, uh, something that, you know, was defying the law of physics. Jesus went to be with God. Okay. All right. Thank you. I have struggled with that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. The idea that it's, you know, it's like a spaceship came down. And yep. And there's a, a famous painting. I can't remember. I think maybe it was Salvador Dali did where at the top of this huge canvas are these two feet, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that that's a stretch. That's a stretch to think it happened yeah. that way. Yeah. yeah. Because the whole idea of heaven being up uh, comes from you know, this prehistoric uh, and, and uh, what do you call it, ancient idea that uh, the earth was not round, mm -hmm. you know, the earth was uh, flat and there was this dome over it, you know, and that the heavens were outside of the dome. Mm -hmm. uh, and that that was where God dwelled, out, up mm -hmm. above the dome. Yeah. Right. Oh, I'm glad I asked that question. <laughs> Anything else before I, I pray so Mary Lee knows when to end the, <laughs> end the tape? <laughs> okay, let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this hour. Uh, we thank you for uh, the experience of exploring your word with its infinite treasures for us. We ask that you be with us. Uh, as we go our separate ways, um, help us to uh, ponder the scriptures uh, so that when we come to worship on Sunday, uh, we will have uh, a renewed uh, understanding of the scriptures for worship and how they uh, enable us to worship you. In Christ's name we pray, amen.